A new year and a new trade deal. The world's largest free trading bloc opens for business in Asia, covering a third of global economic output. So, who will benefit? And why did India pull out of the agreement at the last minute? This is Inside Story. Hello and welcome to the program. I'm Mohammed Jamjoum. After 10 years of work, the world's largest free trade zone is opening for business on January 1st, 2022. The regional comprehensive economic partnership covers 15 countries across the Asia Pacific region and promises to improve business for 2.2 billion people. RCEP, as it will be known, was conceived in 2011 and ratified in November 2020. It'll be the first free trade deal between China, South Korea, and Japan. The U.S. is not part of the agreement, even though it is in the Asia-Pacific region. And India pulled out at the last minute. China, by far the biggest economy in the bloc, says the trade pact will help the country promote growth as the region tries to recover from the pandemic. After the RCEP takes effect, over 90 percent of merchandise trade between the members will be subject to zero tariffs. On January 1, 2022, more than 65% of China's trade with ASEAN, Australia and New Zealand are expected to immediately achieve zero tariffs. Overall, the RCEP member countries have committed to opening up more than 100 service trade sectors, covering finance, telecommunications, transport, tourism, research and development. RCEP is made up of 10 Southeast Asian countries as well as South Korea, China, Japan, Australia, and New Zealand. The agreement will provide a simpler trading framework, meaning businesses won't have to navigate separate requirements to export to different countries. Around 90% of trade tariffs within the bloc will eventually be eliminated. It will also cover nearly 30% of global economic output and a third of the world's population. India decided against joining the trade bloc in 2019 out of concern that it would be flooded with cheap imports from China. All right, let's bring in our guests from Phnom Penh, Cambodia, Jayant Menon, a visiting senior fellow at the ICS Yusuf Ishak Institute. Joining us from Beijing, Einar Tangen, a China political and economics analyst. And in Washington, D.C., Niels Graham, an assistant director with the Atlantic Council's Geoeconomic Center. A warm welcome to you all, and thanks for joining us today on Inside Story. Jayant, let me start with you first today. Who benefits the most with this RCEP agreement? the large countries or the smaller ones? Okay, thank you. I think that's a good question to start off with. And let me uh, start by saying I think everyone benefits, both the large and the small. But I think the smaller countries, uh, the newest members of ASEAN in particular, like Cambodia where I am, but also Myanmar, Laos, Vietnam, have the greatest potential to gain the most. Uh, this is because they are the ones that have to go through the greatest amount of change uh, in terms of reforms uh, uh, that uh, RASEPS provides them the opportunity to do. Uh, but that's the key point, I think, about this agreement. It's designed really in such a way that it's up to the members to take advantage or to go as far as they want to in making those changes. So uh, these countries can potentially be the biggest uh, beneficiaries, but they have to uh, grab that opportunity. I know that a lot of people uh, think that China will be the main uh, sort of beneficiary uh, and has been driving the whole process. China is already a big player. Uh, the incremental gains are unlikely to be that big. Of course, they will gain. And that's why they're in it, but nothing like the percentage increases that we can expect to see from the newest, smallest members. Einar, let me ask you to pick up on a point that Jayant was making there about how much China has to gain in all of this. Of course, we know that the U.S. and India aren't included in this deal. So does that mean that going forward, China dictates the rules when it comes to trade in Asia? 
Uh, not, not at all. Uh, if you check with the, the RECEP rules, it's uh, very simple. It's, it's, it's all about collaboration. Uh, people have to agree. Uh, it's not something where one country can dictate. This is not like uh, uh, the World Bank or the IMF or something like that, where there are special rights reserved to uh, uh, particular members uh, who can control who's president and uh, kind of move things around as they see fit. Niels, I saw you nodding along to some of what Einar was saying there. Did you want to jump in? Yeah, I largely agree with what Einar was saying. I would say, though, it does put China more in the driver's seat of uh, kind of the future of Asian trade and economic rules. I would say one really important part of RECIP is sort of its uh, forward-looking agenda and the fact that the negotiators wanted to create kind of a platform to discuss kind of future rules within Asian trade and economics. And I just think U.S. Is, and India are not at the table where China is. So we could see East Asia come to a consensus on issues like state-owned enterprises, on issues like digital trade that may run counter to overall U.S. interests. Niels, when it comes to the U.S. not being at the table, as you put it, uh, what does this mean when it comes to China's increasing role and growing influence, uh, even as the U.S. influence wanes? Yeah, I, I think by agreeing to this um, a trader deal. Um, I think it's a message to those outside the tent, namely the U.S., that East Asia and uh, Southeast Asia are willing to move on trade with or without the support of the U.S. And I think it's very important now for the U.S. to reflect upon itself and figure out what its policy is going forward on uh, Asian economics and on trade, uh, more generally speaking. Jayant, how is this RCEP deal different from the Trans-Pacific Partnership deal, or TPP as it's known, which involved the U.S. in which they tried to get off the ground, but then they pulled out of. Right. So I think that's a good starting point. Uh, the TPP is no longer what it was. It's now the CPTPP, which is a significantly watered down version of what the U.S. had initially proposed uh, now after it pulled out. And so, but still, even in this watered down form, it is a much more ambitious uh, agreement than uh, RCEP uh, that we have with us. Uh, the, the membership of RCEP is so diverse. You have very rich countries like Singapore. You have very um, uh, poor countries like Laos and Cambodia. You've got populous nations. Uh, so you cannot, uh, you have to account for that diversity by allowing uh, flexibilities. And flexibility translates into generally lack of uh, prescribed depth. So uh, that's the key difference in the level of ambition, the level of depth. But uh, countries can go as far as they are able to or willing to, but the uh, minimum bar set is quite low to accommodate the huge diversity. That's I'm the key difference. Einar, from your vantage point there in Beijing, do you think that there's any possibility we could see the CPTPP and this RCEP deal possibly merging in the future? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, uh, both of them, um, well, uh, TCPTP uh, basically starts out very strong, as uh, my colleague uh, pointed out. Uh, RCEP starts out a little bit weaker. It gives uh, nations uh, a lot more leeway in terms of protecting a certain percentage of their industries. Um, and also, uh, there is a, a much looser form of, in terms of labor and safety standards and subsidies. So that's where it starts out. But every year, uh, that is decreasing. So at some point, it gets to a level where it would be very acceptable to TCTPP, and it would be imaginable that they would, in fact, merge together. Now, China has obviously um, you know, has said that they want to embrace TCTPP, not embrace, join. Uh, and that's causing some consternation. But it shows that, you know, China is moving forward on trade. It is not trying to sell, you know, lots of weapons and things like that. It's really talking about the sustenance of life, uh, how we can all uh, get along together. So from Beijing's point of view, they see this as a sharp, sharp contrast to American uh, strategies, which seem to be much more around security and selling military hardware uh, without really any kind of clear, comprehensive plan economically. There's a lot of talk, but very little action. Niels, how do you foresee, at least in the short term, all of this impacting global trade? 
Um, in the short term, I don't think it'll have a very sizable impact on global trade. Again, this uh, agreement builds on pre-existing trade deals between member countries. So around 82% of the trade flows covered by RECIP are actually covered by pre-existing agreements. I think where you'll see the most immediate impact is going to be in uh, Northeast Asia. RECIP is the first trade deal to cover the bilateral trade relationship of China and Japan and South Korea and Japan. These are both very surprisable and very important trading relationships in East Asia, which up to now have been failed to cover by any trading arrangement. So I think that's where you'll see the most immediate impact. But overall, again, this is a trade agreement with a 20 year time horizon. So uh, as other presenters have pointed out, you know, over time, it will definitely make a sizable impact on the global economy. But immediately, I don't think we'll see very many large changes. Jayant, I know you touched upon this a little bit uh, in an earlier answer, but when do you think that people in the region are really going to start seeing the benefits of this? Um, I think uh, there will be some immediate benefits. I mean, it comes into uh, force tomorrow, and there are some goods that will get a duty-free access starting tomorrow. Uh, but as your previous commentator mentioned, this is a long-term project, right? 20 years. And in fact, all the um, significant reforms uh, contained within uh, this agreement uh, dealing with difficult and challenging issues will be backloaded. Uh, they'll be left towards the end as these things naturally work out. Uh, and so uh, those things will not happen for another decade or so. So we'll see some effect uh, immediately. Um, and there will be this you know, demonstration effect, feel good factor, uh, but I think overall, though, um, what uh, we will actually witness uh, is this, uh, what we don't actually observe, which is a rise in protectionism. So this is why it's difficult to actually measure the impact sometimes, uh, because the greatest benefit is what doesn't happen. There's a tendency now for protectionist sentiments to increase, and hopefully RCEP will put a lid on that and stop countries uh, you know, looking inward at a time where they are feeling insecure about uh, jobs and uh, growth prospects. So a lot of these effects will be what doesn't happen as much as what does happen in the short run. Einar, what do you say? How long is all this going to take to have a real impact on trade in Asia? Well, actually, I think it'll be have a much more immediate impact. I mean, you have to start weighing what happened over uh, since 2019. It was small, medium-sized enterprises that were hit very, very hard. And every single one of the countries involved, regardless of where they are, it's these small, medium-sized enterprises, which are the ones who create jobs, uh, opportunities, um, and a lot of the GDP. So this idea of always trying to measure things in terms of large corporations, I think, is wrong. I mean, if I'm a small business in any one of these countries, and now uh, the same rules apply to what other markets there, it gives me a lot of leeway. I don't have to learn uh, about different markets. I can simply go out there and do it. Plus, they, you know, these countries, especially at the lower end, and I agree, Cambodia and Myanmar uh, stand to, to have tangible benefits. They have a labor dividend. And as you can see, um, you know, with wages rising in the U.S. and other places, uh, inflation rearing its other uh, ugly head, uh, companies are going to be looking to cut costs, and there's a uh, real uh, possibility that they'll start looking at these countries because they are in uh, a recognizable trade zone that's enforceable, uh, and it makes things a lot easier, especially if they're within that zone. Niels, it looked to me like you may have wanted to add to what Einar was saying there. Please go ahead if you had a point you wanted to make. Yeah, I, I think one of the largest immediate impacts of a RECIP will be on the changes to sort of non-tariff barriers. I think one thing it does that's very important is really unifies Asia into a much more of a singular trading block. As I mentioned before, RECIP is built on five pre-existing trade deals. And previously, you know, companies operating in Asia had to qualify each for each individual trading arrangement for their goods to qualify for that specific deal. And what RECIP does is unifies all of these into one singular agreement. So things like rules of origin, for example, are now unified across Asia, making it much easier for uh, companies to view Asia as a singular trading block rather than you know, five disparate agreements. Niels, let me also ask you, I mean, how concerned is the US about this agreement? And also, what can the US do to ensure that its strategic interests are still relevant to East Asian economies? Yeah, I think the U.S. is still very much trying to figure out its uh, Asian economic policy. I think since we withdrew from TPP back at the start of the Trump administration, we really haven't had a cohesive economic Asian policy. So I think first and foremost, it's very important for the U.S. to kind of figure out what their perspective is going forward and how to implement it 
within Asia. And I think one very easy way to do this is rejoining uh, CPTPP, although I don't think that's politically tenable within the US. So instead, I do believe it should begin focusing much more on sort of sunrise industries, as well as more rule setting within the international trading space. And you're beginning to see that uh, done sort of in the digital space right now with the uh, Commerce Secretary Romando going uh, on her Southeast Asia tour and discussing the sort of digital trade arrangement. So I think it's very important to watch and see what develops uh, in that front. I know, I saw you just now nodding to some of what Niels was saying. Did you want to jump in? Yeah, I, I did. I mean, I, I don't think the U.S. has any uh, cho choice politically. It can't join RCEP because that would be capitulating to China. It can't join TCTPP because it wouldn't get the 23 provisions that were struck down, which were in favor of the U.S. and especially uh, the larger corporations. I think where they should be looking at is the WTO. Uh, the U.S. is holding the keys there. They're refusing to uh, allow any appellate judges in there, and therefore there's no enforcement mechanism. Uh, the WTO needs reform. Uh, I think it's a it's a better venue for the U.S. It would actually be supported uh, by the rest of the world because no one is doing all of these uh, you know regional trade agreements because you know they didn't like the WTO. It's just it's a non-functioning body now. Jayant, can this agreement really work when there are a lot of countries involved that have trade or geopolitical issues with each other? I'm talking about China and Australia, for example, or China and Japan, or Japan and South Korea. I mean, how is this effectively going to work when you have countries that make up this block that do have quite serious issues with one another? Uh, I think that's a good point. Um, well, uh, the short answer is that, uh, you know, they'll have to use this as a, a vehicle to try and, uh, you know, deal with those uh, problems that they have with each other. And this is the best way to go forward um, in addressing uh, those sorts or well, in preventing those sorts of non-trade issues interfering with what is a mutually beneficial exchange. So uh, I think this is how we can slowly work towards, you know, dealing with uh, those difficulties in the longer term. But we, we know that, you know, uh, trade can occur uh, uh, even when, uh, you know, relationships are not at their best. Uh, there's a whole history of that happening. And I think, uh, you know, RCEP is one way in which uh, perhaps some of those concerns can actually find resolution over time. It won't interfere uh, with trade. It can actually help uh, deal with the underlying sources of friction, I think, uh, uh, over time as trade is a way of actually dealing with it. Using trade policy as a means of dealing with those non-trade issues, we know doesn't work. And in fact, it punishes both countries. And the US-China trade war is the best example of that. Einar, let me get your take on this too. I mean, the fact that these countries have issues with one another, is that going to complicate the deal going forward or is that going to smooth things out going forward? No, I, I believe uh, I agree with my colleague here. What you have is a, you, you have to have an open door, a platform and a cost uh, for imposing either security or political, uh, you know, uh, oars in the in the water on these particular issues. Um, trading is always good. Um, you know, it's mutually beneficial. Uh, Hopefully, as, as uh, my colleague said, this will be the basis by which countries can come to some sort of terms. Right now, if you know, in, within the international press and other places, you know, there's a lot of vilification of different countries, depending on uh, different ideas. Um, you, know, you have to start somewhere, and uh, you know, obviously, uh, looking at uh, you know political ideas is not the way to go. So let's let's try trade. Jayant, let me ask you, why did India? pull out of RCEP? Is it just that India is concerned about opening up to China? Was that the main bone of contention here, or was there more to it? Um, OK, so I can't really speak uh, for India, uh, but I think what you just said is probably the most likely reason. I think there was concerns about um, uh, Chinese goods flooding the Indian market. But I think more generally, um, the current uh, Modi administration is not yet fully convinced of the benefits of liberalization. Uh, India has a, a tendency to judge every free trade agreement in terms of its bilateral surplus or deficit. Uh, that is a wrong way to go about it. 
uh, that is a very old mercantilistic view of trade policy, and it's still hanging on to that idea. And I think, unfortunately, uh, the Modi administration is starting to reverse some of the good works that have been done over the last couple of decades in moving India forward towards a more liberal and open economy. So I think there is fear of China, but it's part of a broader distrust of uh, liberalization and judging every free trade agreement as to whether it adds to your trade surplus as being good, and if it doesn't, it's bad, is also something it needs to overcome, but underlies the current hesitancy uh, to engage in these sorts of mega-regional. Niels, could we see RCEP play a role in easing U.S.-China tensions or even resolving U.S.-China trade war? Uh, I'm not sure RCEP will play a direct role in easing either of these tensions. I think RCEP um, doesn't really address any of the core issues brought about by the U.S.-China trade uh, sort of trade wars. And I think, um, again, it really is up to the U.S. to try to figure out what its East Asian trade policy looks like, and more generally speaking, what its Asian or sorry Chinese economic policy looks like. And I think before the U.S. figures these things out, it really just cannot help out address any of these core issues. Jayant, RCEP was first imagined 10 years ago. So what I'm curious about is if it actually addresses these trade and economic issues that we are facing today, especially those highlighted by the pandemic, like supply chain issues, for example? Oh, yes. I think, you know, uh, at the core of RCEP is this promotion and support for supply chains. Of course, the, uh, the difficulties we are observing now with supply chains will go away uh, once this unevenness of the demand response um, after a huge period of lockdown and adjustment uh, that we've had to go through. Um, but RCEP is all about uh, strengthening uh, the supply chains in this region, increasing their resilience, and also uh, facilitating uh, uh, an environment where you know, uh, more digitalization can take place so that they're more responsive to the kinds of shocks they are going through now. So even though it, uh, it's been a long time in the making, I think uh, the fact that it took so long also uh, indicates how it needed to address different concerns of different countries. And you know the agenda had to evolve with the changing circumstances uh, that we find ourselves in. And I think there's enough sort of flexibilities built in to respond to uh, changing needs. The question now is whether countries uh, will take advantage of these uh, uh, flexibilities uh, to move the uh, reform agenda forward or just use it as a way of actually backing off from doing some real changes? That's the real question. Einar, will RCEP provisions on transparency and on adoption of international standards mean that going forward we'll see members utilizing or incorporating best practices more into their procedures? Well, uh, yes, uh, that's that's the theory. Uh, the question is how it is enforced and um, who's going to do that. I mean, th this is in the end, these are sovereign nations. They've uh, agreed to do um, to join this entity. Uh, there are enforcement mechanisms, but it's going to be very hard to do that. It really has to be a situation where, um, you know, if, you, if you're not obeying these rules, especially as it goes to safety and things like this, uh, that there will be peer pressure from the rest of the group saying, listen, you, you signed on to this, please adhere to it. Um, but uh, in the end, it's about peer to peer. This is not, as I said, it's not a corporate where your 51% makes the rule. This is uh, really, you know, uh, countries have to come together and agree uh, where they want to go. Einar, we have less than a minute left. Let me just follow up with you about the point you were making. Are we going to be seeing agreements going forward between countries in this block to ensure that best practices are implemented? Uh, I, the, the agreement's already there. The, the, the issue is, are they going to react on it? And my, as my colleague said, you know, you can either run with the ball or you can sit on it. Um, and that is up to each nation. What will be interesting is if this uh, RCEP starts expanding, if South America decides that they want to get involved, mm -hmm. um, and, and you start to seeing a snowball effect, mm -hmm. But then uh, there could be more pressure to actually do these uh, types of mm. uh, agreements all and right, stick well, we, by them. All right. Well, we have run out of time, so we're going to have to leave the conversation there. Thanks so much to all of our guests, Jayant Menon, Einar Tangen, and Niels Graham.
And thank you too for watching. You can see the program again anytime by visiting our website, aljazeera.com. And for further discussion, go to our Facebook page. That's facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. You can also join the conversation on Twitter. Our handle is at AJ Inside Story. From me, Mohammed Jamjoum, and the whole team here at Inside Story, we wish all our viewers around the world a very happy new year. See you next time.